thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers for having me here, not in presence, sadly, in remote. And uh, so my uh, seminar uh, today is kind of a continuation or a, uh, let's say a, a specialization of what o Olivia has uh, already told you in her lectures. Um, basically, um, I will remind you briefly. Oh, are we? Why? Okay. What she talked about. So um, she presented you with this general formalism for relative topos theory, which we've been uh, working with using vibrations and the comorphisms of sites. She has already told you that this formalism uh, emerged in an article by uh, Jean Giraud of 1972, but was, let's say, not exploited pretty much at all in the, in the, in this following years. And um, so this general way of doing relative topos theory um, sees relative toposes, so toposes over a base topos, using uh, vibrations. And these vibrations are naturally thought as homomorphisms of sites. Um, and uh, she is also, she's uh, also mentioned you the fundamental adjunction, which we proved, which connects on the one side um, cloven vibrations over a base category or indexed categories over that category, and the toposis over the base topos of sheets for that, uh, for that category when it is endowed with a topology. Um, the content uh, of uh, this work, urgent work, which is called the uh, relative topos theory of a stacks, it's, uh, you can find it on, on archive and it's an ongoing project, so it will get bigger over time. And what I will focus on uh, in this uh, seminar is the application of this formalism to the theory of sheaves. So uh, Olivia has told you we are working with vibrations, we are working with stacks. Stacks are the natural generalization of sheaves, so we can do the opposite way around and start with our formalism with vibrations and homomorphisms of sites and see how these uh, can yield some interesting results in the theory of sheaves over a base uh, site. And uh, in uh, this scenario, which we can call discrete, because sheaves really are just discrete stacks, discrete stacks, the vibrational formalism allows us to, to find uh, a, new, uh, a new definition to, to see, uh, have a new perspective on some well-known constructions about sheaves. And uh, in particular, what I will be showing you today is what we can say about the shiftification process of a sheaf, of pre-sheaves, uh, and the direct and inverse image of sheaves along a morphism of sites, or more generally, a continuous functor, topologically continuous functor. Um, so I will start with the shiftification, and to find this uh, uh, vibrational description of the shiftification, we will go through the fundamental adjunction in some sense. But uh, in uh, the um, the way that the fundamental adjunction, which is two categorical, it lives at the level of the two category of vibrations and the two category of uh, toposes over the base topos, how it reflects into the discrete environment. So before doing that, we must first recall how uh, the pre-shift bundle adjunction for topological spaces works, because we will see that the discrete um, version of our fundamental adjunction is in fact the generalization. It's a, it's a discrete case of the fundamental adjunction, but at the same time, it's a generalization of the pre-shift bundle adjunction for topological spaces. So we'll briefly recall you how uh, this adjunction works. We have two categories. So we have our topological space X and two categories, the category of pre-shifts over our space X and the category of topological spaces over X. These are usually called the bundles over X. The adjunction is made, of course, of two functors, the left adjoint lambda and the right adjoint gamma, which are defined as follows. Uh, the left adjoint lambda is called the bundle of germs functor. And uh, I, I remind you, for those who may not remember how it is defined, what do you do is that you take a pre-shift P over X, so something which is in here, you consider for each point X in your base space X, the stock of P at X. 
The stock of a pre-shift is defined basically by taking equivalence classes of values of your pre-shift in the open neighborhood of X. So you have an open neighborhood of X, call it U, you have a certain element S of T of U, uh, and you consider equivalence classes whenever two elements in P over two different open, uh, open neighborhood of X become equal if you restrict to a certain open neighborhood of X, small enough to be contained inside the intersection of the two opens. So this allows you to define the stock of P at a certain point X, you glue all the stocks together into this uh, union, this joint union of sets, and of course you have a, a function going to your, to your set X, to your topological space X. You can endow this set with a certain topology so that this map is in fact a continuous map. So this is how lambda works, taking a pre-shift and building a bundle over X. It's right adjoint, the local sections functor, instead works in this way, it takes a bundle, so a continuous map from a certain E to X, and it considers its pre-shift of local sections. How are these defined? Well, for, e, for every open U in X, you define the value of gamma P at U to be the collection of continuous maps from U to E, such that when you compose them with P, you get the inclusion of U into X. So this is why they are local sections of P. They are sections on an open subset of, of X. And this is really just a contravariant home factor, if you see, because we are setting the second component and we are letting the first component vary upon the, sub, the open subsets of X, but this is contravariant, a uh, contravariant home factor for E, a sort of contravariant home factor. Um, so you can prove that these two functors are one, the left adjoint of the other, but this adjunction has way more properties than, than just being an adjunction. Because, well, the first property is that when you restrict to fixed points in the adjunction, you get something which is very interesting. Because, uh, I remind you, uh, every adjunction has fixed points, and a fixed point is uh, an element which is isomorphic to its image via the adjunction. So a fixed point, for instance, in here, will be a pre-shift such that if you apply lambda and gamma, you get, some, you get a result which is isomorphic to the pre-shift you started with. And similarly for fixed points in the bundles over X. What happens is that the fixed points in pre-shifts are exactly the shifts for the topological space X, while the fixed points in the category of bundles over X are what are called the etal bundles over X. Uh, etal bundles are just local homeomorphisms on 2x. When you restrict an adjunction to its fixed points, you always get an equivalence of categories. So you know by this that sheaves can be seen as the etal bundles over x. The second very interesting property of this adjunction is that if you take a pre sheaf in here, you apply lambda and then you apply gamma, in general, you will not get back the pre sheaf but you will get its shipification. So there is a functor here, which is left adjoint to this inclusion, which maps every pre sheaf in here to its best approximation, uh, its best sheaf approximation. And this functor is called the associated sheaf functor or shipification functor. And you can recover that functor for a topological space by applying lambda and gamma. So what we can take about these two properties of the adjunction is first is that pre sheaves over a space can be thought, and most importantly, sheaves over a space can be thought as a category of spaces. It is, it's really the content of this equivalence. Sheaves are spaces over X, certain kind of space over X. While this description of the shiftification factor gives you a geometric understanding of the process of the building the associated uh, uh, sheaf, because you see, this allows you to see the shiftification of a pre shift as the collection of local sections of a certain bundle over X. So it's a very geometric and hands on definition. Um, so we will see in a moment how this generalizes to all sites. Um, for those of you who've seen my seminar in June, it's pretty much this first part of the seminar is pretty much the same. We are building this uh, uh, site, uh, this pre shift bundle adjunction for sites. Before doing that, I just mentioned that the topological adjunction can be formulated for locales. 
So uh, a locale, uh, if you will, it's, it's a generalization of, let's say, of the notion of topology over a topological space, uh, point free generalization of the notion of topology in a certain sense. You can speak about pre sheaves over a locale and sheaves over a locale. You can speak, of course, of locales over a base locale and also of etal locales over a base locale. And you can get the exact same picture a left adjoint, which is a sort of bundle of germs, let's say, a right adjoint, which is uh, still a contravariant room functor in a certain sense. The adjunction restricts at the level of sheaves and the tal locales, the fixed points to an equivalence. And the composite lambda gamma gives the sheafification factor. So this tells us already that the topological adjunction is, is a special case of something which is wider, it's, it's more general, because it, we already have a point free generalization of it. And um, so we want to do the same for all sites now. We want to do that. Once we have a general adjunction in here, where instead of L, we'll have any site, CJ. Um, we will be able to recover its shiftification using the two adjoints. And the, the adjunction that we will get will be in also not only a generalization of these results, but also a restriction of the fundamental adjunction living, which lives at the two categorical level of vibrations. So first of all, well, we start with the first question is, if we substitute a topological space X with a site, Who's gonna take the place? What's gonna take the place of bundles over X? And we recur to the general mantra of topos theory that toposes are a generalization of spaces. So we can think that instead of a category of topos, uh, sorry, of topological spaces over a base uh, topological space, we will take a category of toposes over a base uh, topos. The base topos will be given by our site, so it's only fair to just take all toposes over the topos of sheaves for our site. In this way, not only toposes generalize topological spaces, but also geometric morphisms are the natural generalizations of continuous maps. Um, there is a problem in size here, though, which comes from the fact that we want to define gamma as a contravariant home functor in, in a certain sense. And of course, home functors, when you take home functors in here, they will never give you pre sheaves because they will never give you sets. You have way too many geometric morphisms between two different toposes. Uh, even with the condition of being over the same base topos, you still have too many to, to have just a set. It's gonna be, it's gonna be always a class, pretty much always a class. So we have to restrict a little bit the toposes with which we are working. And uh, we introduce, so to, to get around this size issue, we introduce relatively small toposes. So we say that a topos E over our base topos sheaves for CJ is a small relatively to sheaves of CJ. If this condition holds for each X, an object of C, the category of geometric morphisms, so geometric morphisms over our base from this slice topos, this is the topos sliced over the representable sheaf at X. And we take the geometric morphisms from this topos to E, we ask that this class of geometric morphisms, up to equivalence of geometric morphisms, of course, is a set. And we denote the category of toposes that are small relatively to our base topos with topos with an S, uh, upper S. So uh, when we will work with this, in a moment we will see that now we can define gamma, and gamma is going to be a pre-shift because we are restricting up to equivalence. We are asking that we don't have too many geometric morphisms between these toposes. Um, so we, we have generalized top, uh, topological spaces over X to small toposes over our base topos. By small, I mean small relatively to the base. Um, we also want to generalize the notion of etal bundle, but uh, generalizing etal to, to the level of toposes is already given. I mean, we have a definition of an etal topos in literature. Uh, a topos E over our base topos sheet CJ is called etal or a local homeomorphisms or a local homeomorphism. Again, by uh, analogy with the topos, the, the topological case, if it is equivalent to a slice topos, of our base topos, with the geometric morphism in the middle being the canonical geometric morphism. So it's the essential geometric morphism 
whose um, direct image is the dependent product, the inverse image is the pullback, or in this case, the product, and the uh, uh, essential image is called the dependent sum. We denote the category of etal toposis over a base topos with etal over shift cj. And um, one can prove that all etal toposis are small relatively to their base, and thus we have the etal toposis over our base embed fully faithfully inside small toposis over our base, relatively small toposis. And this completes the picture because now we substitute our topological space with a site, bundles over the space with the toposis that are small over the base topos, etal bundles with etal toposis. It is now a matter of defining gamma and lambda. So the local sections functor gamma is going to be a local section functor by mapping any topos over our base topos, relatively small of course, to this pre sheep So we take the geometric morphisms over the relative geometric morphisms over our base from any slice over our representable to E. You see that we know that this is a set because we are asking that E is uh, relatively small. Of course, everything is up to equivalence of geometric morphisms. So this is the definition, of, the definition of gamma, which is really a contravariant home factor. The left adjoint, the bundle of germs, let's call it, is somehow trickier to define, but Olivia has already anticipated you who it is. We take, so we are starting from pre sheaves and we want to build a topos over our base topos. What we do is, by starting with a pre sheaf P, we consider its category of elements over C, which is a vibration, it's the Grothendieck construction applied to pre sheaf We know that we can endow this category, uh, category of elements for P, we can endow it with what we call the Giro topology. The Giro topology is the smallest topology on this category, such that the canonical projection onto C is a comorphism of sites. Uh, I remind you also that if this is a comorphism of sites with respect to certain topology, it induces covariantly a geometric morphism. So we have, in fact, a geometric morphism from this topos, which is the Giro topos for P, to our base topos. And we take this, this uh, geometric morphism as the image of P via lambda. So we have now defined uh, the actors in our, in our junction. Of course, we, they are defined on objects, but the, the extension to arrows is, is pretty easy, straightforward. And uh, we now want to check the junction. And it's quite easy once you get this lemma. This lemma is stating, you see, this is our pre shift P with its Giro topology. So this is the Giro topos of the pre shift P. And you can prove that this Giro topos is a colimit of a certain diagram. You see, it's indexed by the elements inside P, the category of elements of P, and it's a diagram of etal toposis. So you take a couple in here given by an, an object X of your category C and an element A in P of X, and that is mapped to the uh, topos shift CJ over LJ of X, the object in C indexing uh, that object in here. You can prove this. Olivia has already told you that zero toposis are always weighted pseudo colimits of uh, etal toposis. When you are working with discrete uh, vibrations this, or discrete uh, pseudo functors, so pre sheaves, uh, in fact, the weighted colimit becomes just a pseudo colimit, a conical pseudo colimit. So you don't have the weights on the nodes of your colimit. With this lemma, it's it's pretty much done because at this point, if you take a pre shift P over C and a relatively small topos E over shift CJ, and you take a geometric morphism from lambda of P, which is the Giro topos of P, to E over your base, well, this geometric morphism, since it comes from a colimit, can be defined by a co cone coming from your diagram with vertex C. So a geometric morphism in here. Is actually given by a cocon whose legs come from representables of this form and they are indexed by the elements in the category of elements of P. And then you write this out explicitly and you see that what you get is just a natural transformation coming from the uh, pre shift P to this pre shift. It's the pre shift of geometric morphisms from representable 
uh, sorry, slices of representables to E. And this is just gamma. So getting from an error lambda P to E to an error P to gamma E, and of course you can read it in reverse and going back from here to here, we have just shown uh, quite quickly that lambda is the left adjoint of gamma. Now, we, that's very nice, but we also want that this adjunction preserve those properties that the topological adjunction had. And in fact, it does. To, to see that, we use other properties of a tal toposis. One is very well known. So uh, it tells you that geometric morphisms over any, this holds for any topos, between two slices over the base topos can be seen as arrows inside the base topos. Any geometric morphism from here to here over E is the same as an arrow from A to B. The second lemma, which technical lemma, tells you that the girotopos of a pre sheaf, which is again the sheaves for the vibration with the girotopology, is equivalent to the slice of our base topos over the sheafification of your pre sheaf E. Using these, you can prove that the fixed points of our adjunction are who we want to be, so uh, are who uh, we want them to be. So sheaves on one side and the tal toposis on the other. Because if you start with an etal uh, topos over the base topos and you calculate its gamma, well, gamma is defined as this contravariant home factor. Notice that we are considering over the base topos arrows between two slice toposis, so we can apply this result and see elements in here as arrows inside the base topos from the object index in the first slice to the object index in the second metal topos. So from here to here. But then we just use Ioneta's lemma, and this is isomorphic equivalent to F. This implies that the fixed points in the category of toposes that are small over sheaf CJ are the etal toposes, because etal toposes are fixed, and any other thing which is fixed is going to be isomorphic to an etal topos. Vice versa, you just do pretty much the same progress process, starting from here. Instead of F, we put AJ of P, we use Yoneda, we move to a tal toposis using the first line here, and then this is just gamma of this thing, and this thing we've seen is lambda of P. So we get that the shiftification of a pre-shift P is gamma of lambda of P. This tells us not only that the fixed points in the pre-sheaves are precisely the sheaves for our topology J, but also that the sheafification of P can be recovered by applying first lambda and then gamma. And so the picture that we get is the same that we got earlier in, to in the topological case. Pre-sheaves over a category and sheaves over the category, over the side on one side, Toposis small relatively to the base topos, and the tal toposis small relatively to the base topos. We have an adjunction over here. We have the fixed points are sheaves and the tal toposis, and so our adjunction gives us this equivalence. And finally, the application of lambda and gamma gives us the shiftification factor from pre sheaves to sheaves. So this is the picture, and we will use in a moment this picture to build out a description of the shiftification, which uses uh, vibrations in its language. Before uh, doing that, I just recall you that the two categorical adjunction, so the two categorical adjunction started instead from, not from pre sheaves but from pseudofunctors or uh, cloven vibrations on the one side, and it takes all toposes over the base topos on the other side, the functor lambda is still the girotopos functor, and the functor gamma is still a contravariant home functor. So you could alternatively get this result by applying this result and restricting, restricting it in R. So this adjunction that we got is a reflection, is a truncation, is a, a discretization of the fundamental adjunction uh, Olivia has already talked about in her lectures. Um, so this is going up in complexity, as I titled the slice. If we go down instead, so we want to, uh, let's say, describe things in a more concrete way. Well, we take a pre shift P, an object X in our category, shiftification of P at X is this set, which is, uh, it, it's not that great because it's a, it's a class of geometric morphisms. Okay, it's up to equivalence, but it's, it's not that great. Though, we know that we can describe geometric morphisms using 
the sites in terms of generators. So the sites give us, in a way, um, the generators of our topos. So we can just define stuff using the elements of the, the objects of the base site. And we can do it in three different ways. The first way is the most standard one. A geometric morphism from here to here can be presented by a flat JP continuous functor from this category to this topos. Um, this is the very standard way of seeing geometric morphisms. You, you, you define them by looking at the inverse image of the geometric morphism and looking at how it acts on the representables. And this gives you what is called a flat JP continuous functor. Of course, not all flat JP continuous functors uh, work because not all these functors will give you geometric morphisms over the base topos and such that they commute with our canonical functors, the geometric morphism from these topos and these topos to the base topos. Mm -hmm. So of course, uh, you have conditions on these kind of factors for them to present an element in the shiftification. Um, the maybe less standard way of describing in them, but still quite standard, is by using comorphisms of sites. So while flat JP continuous functors act contravariantly, as uh, they are morphisms of sites in the end, comorphisms of sites define stuff covariantly. So we want a site of definition for this topos, a site of, de of definition for this topos, and a uh, comorphism of site going in this direction. This topos can be presented by this site, and this is just the Giro topos of a representable. So uh, if, you, if you take a representable pre shift and you calculate its uh, Giro site, you get this category and a certain topology J, Jx. And by the lemma I quoted before about Shiro toposis, that topos is equivalent to this slice topos. While on the other hand, this topos can be presented as this very big site, which has as an uh, underlying category, the category of three sheets over the category of elements for P. And as topology, this uh, topology, which is called the pre shift lifting of the topology JP. So you can do this, and of course, not all comorphisms of sites will fit in here. You will have some conditions on them so that they give you a relative geometric morphism. The third point of view, which is uh, more interesting, is that you can present a geometric morphism over, over here using a J-covering family of your object X and the family of morphisms of vibrations from these slice categories to the category of elements. And this is very interesting because you are saying that geometric morphisms over here may not be presented at the level of sites. I mean, they can in this very complex way, but there is an easier way if you allow to define them locally using a J-covering family of X. So you will not have, maybe you will not have a, a, a functor from here to here, but if you restrict along a J-covering family, you will get a functor from here to here, defining it locally. Uh, as a comorphism of site, in fact, using a comorphism of site, in fact. And in order to understand this last point, I won't give you many details, but the idea with which you can get there is by using this definition of the shiftification, which uses, instead of the double plus construction, which you can find in literature, the notion of local imaging family. Uh, so if you take a site CJ and a pre-shift P over that site, two elements X and Y in some P of X X is an object in C. Uh, well, we call them locally equal if there exists a J covering C of R over X, such that X and Y, when restricted along the arrows of R, are equal. So they are locally equal because they may not be equal at their level, but if you restrict enough, they get equal eventually. It's kind of like the same thing that happened with stocks. If you restrict enough, the two things must coincide somewhere. Um, so we have the notion of local equality. With this, we can introduce the notion, the notion of local imaging family. So uh, what, if you look at this, so given a sieve S and an object X, so for now we remove the, the word locally. A matching family for S is a function that assigns to each arrow Y in our sieve an element AY in P of the domain of that arrow in such a way that whenever we have another arrow Z which is composable with Y, the image of AY along Z is equal to A of YZ. YZ, of course, still belongs to S because S is a C. So this is the notion of matching family, which you, you should know better. It's, it's more common. A locally matching family is the same thing, 
But whenever we have this composable uh, error condition, the thing is we ask, we ask for the two elements to be locally equal instead of equal. With this definition, we can define the shiftification of P at an object X as the set of equivalence classes of locally matching families of elements of P for all the possible recovering seeds of X. And these equivalence classes are modulo the local equality on a common refinement. So you have two different locally matching families, one as its sieve, one, another one as another sieve. You get a common refinement of the two sieves such that whenever you check them on that common refinement, all the elements are locally equal. And this construction is not found anywhere in the literature. It's apparently it's attributed to Eduardo de Buc, who proved it in the 80s, but you, you won't find it anywhere. And it's really an alternative to the plus plus construction, which is more algebraic in spirit, while in here it's a bit more geometric because it's, you ask for things to, to check locally instead of being, you know, uh, just be equal, but to be locally equal. And this is enough to recover the shiftification of P. And then you can use this to describe, uh, you, you can see what this locally matching family condition is by considering our description of the shiftification. Because you see, this H, this functor, this geometric morphism H making this triangle commutative is an element of the shiftification because it's, it comes from this topos, which is the slice topos over X, as I mentioned. It goes to the zero topos of P over the base uh, topos. So the, this H belongs to the shiftification of P at X. But you see, uh, what happens is that for every, uh, you can find this result in our, uh, in our paper, for every H uh, done like this, there are a J covering family of X. So you see you have arrows Y, I covering X, and a family of morphisms of vibrations from C over YI to the vibration, uh, the category of elements of P, such that if you take H and you, let's say, restrict along the arrow Y in a certain sense, so you precompose with the geometric morphism used by Y, what you get is a geometric morphism equivalent to a geometric morphism induced by a morphism of vibrations. So your uh, geometric morphism may not be defined by a comorphism of size, of course, this H. But this is telling you that if you restrict along a certain covering family, and there is always a certain covering family like this, you get that your uh, functor H is locally induced by a comorphism, sorry, uh, a morphism of vibrations, which is also a comorphism of size, which is why it induces a geometric morphism. And so the locally matching families are really all those families which when seen at the level of toposes will induce the same geometric morphism, which is why they match. They are locally equal on a common refinement, if and only if they will induce the same geometric morphism over here, the same element of the shiftification. Um, so uh, this is a way of seeing shiftification in terms of, uh, in a vibrational way, because you see an element of the shiftification is the given of the J-covering family of the object X and a family of morphism of of morphisms of vibrations. Of course, they must uh, satisfy some compatibility notions, some compatibility conditions. And um, there are some instances in which you actually can forget everything about the topological information, the topos theoretic information in the junction. One example is that of pre-orders. Um, in the case of pre-orders, we'll see basically the fundamental adjunction completely forgets toposes. You get down at the level of size altogether. So uh, in order to show you this very quickly, I remind you that locales and locales over a base always include fully faithful inside the toposes, and in particular inside toposes small relative to the base. The second thing which I recall, uh, I want to recall is that for any pre-order site, and a pre-order site is a category a pre-order category is a category in which for every pair or every couple of objects, there is at most one arrow from one to the other. So it becomes a pre-order because you have that elements can be just one smaller than the other or bigger or they are isomorphic, but there are no other chances. So you get a pre-order. Um, so you can build the category of its J ideals. Uh, this, is, this can be defined for any category, but for a pre-order site, this category is a local. And it gives a localic presentation of the topos of sheaves for C. More in general, if you take a pre-sheaf 
over a pre-order category C, well, that pre-sheaf, the category of elements of that pre-sheaf is going to be a pre-order. So you can say that for every uh, pre-sheaf over a pre-order category C, its zero topos is a localic topos presented by the locale of JP ideals of the category of elements of P. With this in mind, we can take our definition of the shiftification uh, given by the fundamental adjunction and forget all about the geometric morphisms. So you see, the shiftification of P at X is the collection of geometric morphisms over our base from this slice topos represented by X to the zero topos of P. But now these are both localic toposes. This is presented by the JP ideals of the category of elements of P. And this localic topos is presented by a local of sub ideals of a principal J ideal. And so you see, the shiftification, which lives at the level of toposes, really just lives at the level of locales. You can see it as a collection of local sections of a morphism of locales. So in this case, what we get is that our uh, fundamental adjunction gets this expression. For pre-orders, you have an adjunction between pre sheaves and locales over the local of J ideals. This adjunction is the same. This is no longer the girotopos, but it's the girosai, uh, the, or better, the J ideals, or the JP ideals of the girosai. This is still a contravariant on functor, and it restricts to various equivalents, you see, because um, already pre sheaves are equivalent to a class of uh, morphisms of pre orders, uh, which are called the etal pre orders, while sheaves are equivalent to a class of etal morphisms of locales, or also of J et al morphisms of preorders. So you have a, a certain definition of what an et al arrow of preorders is, of a J et al map of preorder. You can find this on, on our article. And um, all these equivalences, by the way, are generalizations, slight generalizations, this one, of a result by Hemelair in his article uh, by 2020. And uh, um, I also mentioned, I won't show you this, but uh, what we do for pre-orders, actually, pre-orders and locales, um, is very formal in spirit. So you can do the same, you can apply the same strategy on, uh, you could apply the same strategy on other settings. So um, the, what we have, you can find it in the, in the article, is that you have a general restrictibility result that you can apply to the fundamental adjunction. Uh, if you have a certain category of sites or a certain category uh, of sites and morphisms or a certain category of sites and comorphisms, your fundamental adjunction will invariably, you, under some conditions, your fundamental adjunction will restrict uh, to a certain thing of this kind. So an adjunction between pre sheaves and no longer a category of toposis, but a category of sites, which is quite better. And uh, so this is the first, let's say, the first example of, on how we can use a vibrational approach uh, in the case of sheaves, in the context of sheaves. The other two examples, which I mentioned at the beginning, are those of the direct and inverse image of, of sheaves. So I start by reminding you uh, what uh, direct and inverse image are uh, for sheaves uh, on a topological space or in a topos. Sheaves over a topological space can be moved along uh, uh, continuous maps, and we call this usually the change of base for the pre-sheaf. Um, more precisely, if we take a map, a continuous map, f from x to y, we can uh, derive from it a geometric morphism from sheaves over x to sheaves over y, which works in this way. If you take a pre-sheaf over x, something in here, its direct image along f, which is its image in here, denoted in this way, it's defined for any open U in Y in this way. It's basically P precomposed with F to the minus one, of course. Uh, the inverse image will start from here and going here, and it's better defined when you use the et al formalism. So I mentioned at the beginning that sheets over a topological space are equivalent to et al bundles over that space. So we take a sheaf Q over Y, we consider its etal bundle, so it's going to be some p of q over y. And what we can do is that we can pull this arrow back along f. We get an arrow over x at that point, a continuous map over x, which is still an etal bundle over x. So since we have an etal bundle, we can build from it a sheaf over x, and that's, that sheaf is the inverse image of q along f. 
The same thing can be done for sites. And in reality, the topological case is just a particular case of what happens in general with morphisms of sites. Because if you take a morphism of sites, F from CJ to DK, and Olivia has already reminded you, this uh, morphism of sites induces a geometric morphism in the opposite direction. So from sheaves over DK to sheaves over CJ. The right adjoint, the, in, the direct image of the geometric morphism, is just precomposition with F, in the same way as per the, the topological scenario, as in the topological scenario. The inverse image, uh, so the left adjoint of shifts F lower uh, star, well, it's, it's harder to define, but it's basically, you take a pre-shift, sorry, a shift, you see it as a pre-shift, you compute its left can extension along F, and Olivia reminded you that this is just a co-limit of, uh, of pre-shifts, so you get something in here, and then you shiftify it to obtain a sheaf in here. This composition gives you the left adjoint of uh, the precomposition functor here, and, uh, and so gives you the inverse image of your geometric morphism. I remind you that the left can extension is in itself an inverse image, and it's the inverse image at the level of pre shifts because it is the left adjoint of the precomposition with F op. Um, so the question is, can we see this using the, the goggles, the vibrational goggles? And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, we can start by considering um, what the direct and inverse image of vibrations is, of course. Um, so we take a functor, any functor. So for now, we don't worry about topologies. We take a functor from a category C to D and a growth and vibration over D we can pull it back along F, just do the categorical pullback. What we get is that this pullback is a vibration, and we call this the direct image of Q along F. So, <coughs> sorry, the direct image of vibrations is just pullback along a factor. And this gives you a, fun a two factor between categories of vibrations. Um, if you describe this at the level of um, Cloven vibrations, the cloven vibrations correspond to indexed categories, so to pseudofunctors. What happens is that a pseudofunctor over D, uh, you can consider the Grotten deconstruction, gives you this Q, you can pull back along with F, you get this P. This P is still going to be a cloven vibration, so you can get back a pseudofunctor from it. And the pseudofunctor is just precomposition with F. Uh, this F op is just because uh, there's an op on the domain. So basically, the direct image of pseudofunctors along a factor is just precomposition, as it happened for uh, pre sheets The inverse image is somehow trickier to define, and um, as it happens for pre sheets it's going to be a colimit. But since we cannot uh, pretend that we can compute all colimits of categories, we have to restrict a bit and work with small vibrations. So small vibrations have uh, all their fathers being small categories. And if you restrict to small vibrations, you can compute this kind of colimits, which will give you the left adjoint of the direct image. We will call this the pseudo can extension, the left pseudo can extension, and it gets an upper L, it's the, the big L. Uh, how you can compute this is by considering this functor, the functor tau f, which goes from the category C to vibrations over D. And taking every element x, it maps it to this comma. I don't know why I wrote it as a comma category. This is just the category d over the object f of x. And um, you can show that if you take a pseudo functor e over c, its inverse image along f can be computed as a weighted colimit of uh, categories. And it's the colimit of this functor weighted by e. In the same way that the LAN. The left can extension of pre shifts is a colimit. It's a conical colimit in that case. Uh, in this case, we have a weighted colimit of this diagram. By the way, the fact that you have a, a, a conical colimit at the level of pre shifts, but a weighted colimit here, is exactly the same reason why uh, girotoposis for vibrations are weighted colimits, but girotoposis for pre shifts are uh, conical colimits. When the weights are discrete, you can just explode the diagram and you get from a weighted colimit a conical colimit. So we have the level of vibrations that are uh, small vibrations, S here. We have an adjunction between 
uh, where the right adjoint is the precomposition and the left adjoint is the land. Aurivia has already mentioned that um, given a cloven vibration over C, so something which is in here, you can compute explicitly its uh, pseudocan extension, left pseudocan extension, as a localization of this comma category. So you get this comma category and you localize it with respect to a certain class of errors. So, uh, of course, yes, they are colimits, but you can explicitly compute them, especially, especially when you uh, have a certain uh, nice properties for this category. You can uh, build a calculus of fractions, so you can actually get a manageable description of the pseudocan extension along F. Um, so if we want to use this for pre-sheaves, well, we can take any functor, two pre-sheaves, P over the domain and Q over the domain, the direct image from a vibrational point of view is just going to be a pullback. So we take the category of elements of Q, we pull it back along F, we get the category of elements of the, the direct image of Q along F, which is just Q precomposed with F. As per the inverse image, there is another description which will connect to the more general description for sheaves, which is the following. You take your pre-shift P, you consider its category of elements over C and compose it with F. Then you can compute the comprehensive factorization of this composite. The comprehensive factorization uh, was introduced, I guess, in 1974, something, beginning of the 70s. And it's a orthogonal factorization for functors. The first component is a initial or a final functor. The second component is a discrete vibration. So if you start with P, you compose it to the factorization. What you get here is the vibration corresponding to the left can extension of P along F. So how can we do this in general for sheaves? Well, first of all, we ask ourselves, how can we do this for stacks? And the way of doing it for stacks is by considering, um, at the beginning, I told you we were working with morphisms of sites, but the hypothesis of morphism of sites is too much in this case. I mean, you don't really need it. You don't really need your functor f to be a morphism of sites. You can just ask for it to be continuous with respect to the topologies. This is a certain property uh, of functors, which allows you to restrict the precomposition functor. Which we, we, we mentioned earlier, we have the precomposition at the level of uh, vibrations. But if the functor f is continuous, then precomposition preserves the property of being a stack. So you take a stack over D, you precompose with F, you get a stack over C. This functor, the precomposition factor, is the direct image along F for stacks. The inverse image, in a similar way in which, <coughs> sorry, you define it for um, uh, pre-sheaves, is just what? You take stacks, small stacks, you see them as small indexed categories or small cloven vibrations if you want. You apply the pseudocan extension, and then you stackify it. So you have the stackification functor is the two-dimensional analog of the sheetification factor. This composite is the inverse image along F or the, uh, the inverse image along F, which is the left adjoint of this, uh, of this factor, of the precomposition factor for stacks. Now we want to derive in uh, from the description for stacks, we want to derive a description of the left, the, sorry, the inverse image for sheets. Because of course the direct image, since it's the, the behavior is always the same precomposition, the vibrational description is always going to be pulled back along F. There is nothing new. What is new is that we can study the um, connection between stacks and sheets. The connection between stacks and sheets is summed up from, um, uh, via an adjunction. So we have sheaves over our site and small stacks over that site. Sheaves include inside stacks because every sheaf can be seen as a small discrete stack. But there is a way of going from stacks to sheaves, which gives you a left adjoint. We called this functor the truncation functor, the J truncation functor. And uh, the, the way it behaves is it takes a stack, it considers its connected components, and then sheafifies that stack. So you take your stack, you basically you collapse all the arrows in, in, your, uh, in your fibers. So you get a, a, the connected components of the stack and then you shiftify what you got. And um, so this is the uh, um, description of this functor. But what is interesting is that if you see it from a vibrational point of view, 
it acts again as an orthogonal um, factorization system of factors. Because from a vibrational point of view, the truncation factor starts with a J-stack P, so you get your vibration P from a category P to your site C. We suppose it is a J-stack, so it's the vibration connected to a J-stack, and you have a J comprehensive factorization, where J is the topology over C. You can find this on Olivia's article, Denseness Condition, Morphisms, and Equivalences of Toposis. And it's a generalization of the comprehensive factorization. Instead of having a discrete vibration here, you have a discrete J stack. And instead of having, of a, having a cofinal factor in here, you have a J pi cofinal factor. J pi is the um, uh, Giro topology for this stack, and this is just a, a property which generalizes the property of being cofinal. So if you use the J-comprehensive factorization, you can understand the, the truncation, sorry, the truncation really tells you, you take a stack and you take the second component of its J-comprehensive factorization. This is going to be a discrete J-stack, that is to say, it's going to be the vibration for a J-sheet. And so we, we are done because now, one can prove that the inverse image for sheaves is just the inverse image for stacks truncated. You see, you take sheaf, you see it as a stack, you uh, calculate its inverse image at the level of stacks, and then you truncate it. But if you write it out explicitly, what it means is that given a, a J sheaf P, you take your J sheaf P, you compute its category of elements, you compose it with F, and then you compute the relative comprehensive factorization of this factor. You get the first component is our j pi cofinal factor. The second component is going to be a discrete k stack, because it's a stack over d and d was endowed with k. It's going to be a discrete j stack, and so this is going to be effectively a k sheaf, uh, a k sheaf over d. This k sheaf, from a, this is the vibrational description of a k sheaf, is the inverse image of our uh, starting J shift. And so this gives you a way also of seeing um, the inverse image of a shift from a vibrational uh, perspective. And it's really just a phenomenon of orthogonal factorizations of factors. And if you do the same, but you take away the topologies, what you get is that you get the comprehensive factorization and the result I mentioned earlier about three sheets. And uh, with this, I conclude and I thank you for. Uh, for your attention.